I'm Dermot Hussey. Welcome to the YouTube channel for the podcast Riffin Radio. In order to get some more insights on Randy Weston, I spoke to jazz historian and artistic director of the DC Jazz Festival, Willa Jenkins, who collaborated with Randy on his autobiography, African Rhythms. Willard, you describe working with Randy Weston on his autobiography, African Rhythms, as life-altering. Talk about that. You know, I I, uh, I had known Randy for, for, for some, some time before we started working on this book. But I really, uh, our relationship accelerated beginning in 1998 or excuse me, 1995, when he was one of the artists in residence at the Montreal Jazz Festival. And they have what they call an invitation series where they invite an artist to do several days of different facets of their artistry. And uh, one year, Randy was one of the artists in residence, one of the invitation artists. And uh, he did various things during his nights. He did the uh, the blues project that he had made with Johnny Copeland. He did, he did the first evening he did was a trio with Christian McBride and Billy Higgins that was with strings. And that became his album, Earth Birth. And uh, another night it was the African Rhythms Band. And uh, another night it was the Ganawa. So he did several evenings of d- different configurations. And uh, he did, four nights and at the end of the third night uh it was a saturday and my wife and i had already been in montreal for the festival for over a week and it was our day to go home and so that saturday we checked out of our hotel and went down to the press headquarters of the festival hotel and uh just to 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 say farewell to the press people because they had treated us very well and so we get down there and we got a few hours till our flight and they say, oh, you're just in time. Randy Weston is coming to do a press conference at noon. So we said, great, we'll sit, we'll sit here and check out the press conference and speak with Randy. So we checked out the press conference and at the end of the press conference, we walked up to Randy, my wife and I, and we both told him how much we had appreciated what he had done that week in Montreal and that we'd seen these programs and we, we, we just loved what we'd experienced with him and with his African Rhythms Band. And uh, we said, well, un- unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see your final evening of this series because we're leaving today. And he said, oh, he threw up his hands. He said, oh, you can't leave. He said, we're going to Africa tonight. That happened to be the night, the culminating night when he had invited uh, Ganawa from Tangier, Morocco, and from Marrakesh, Morocco, to come to Montreal and perform with him. So I'm standing there talking to him, and my wife slips away. I figure she's got to go to the restroom or whatever the case may be. And she came back about 10 minutes later, and Randy and I still talking. And she says, we're, we're going to the concert tonight. She says, I got us rebooked on another flight and got a hotel room back. And we're going to the concert. So we went to that concert and there was something about that moment that really sealed our relationship. Because not long afterwards, we also met Talib Kibwe, also known as TK Blue, who has had been Randy's music director for many years. And uh, we met him in Trinidad at, at the Pan Jazz Festival. Mm. Yeah, in, in the room next to ours at the hotel. And uh, we became friends with him and at one point I asked him, I said, you know, I've been researching a lot of the NEA Jazz Masters for, for the NEA Jazz Masters website. 
in terms of their bibliographies and their videographies and their biographies, etc., and and establish a page for each of the NEA Jazz Masters. And I said, you know, I, I'm I'm struck by the fact that so few of the great these great masters have had books published about them. And I said, you know, Randy's got a pretty fascinating story. Do you think he'd be interested in a book? And Talib said, yes, he talks about that all the time. So one thing led to another and Randy and I got together and we spent nine years putting together his book, African Rhythms. And that included travels to different places around the world, and many trips to Brooklyn to interview him at his place in Lafayette Avenue and the whole bit. So Randy and I, you know, this was, it, it, it became more than the typical, I think, the typical author subject relationship. Uh, you know, we, we, had, we formed a, a real brotherhood between the two of us. And, and, and he, he became like my big brother and mentor. And uh, it, it, it was a wonderful relationship that we forged as a result of working on this book. In fact, your role in the book was quite unique as that of an arranger. How did that work? Oh, well, you know, Dermot, we, we mentioned uh, Melba Liston a few moments ago. Uh, when I got to my research of Melba Liston and her role with Randy Weston, and then when Randy and I sat down for some extensive interviews strictly on his role with Randy, he, how he and Melba Listen came together and how they worked together for so many years on his arrangements and how whenever he had a large project, you know, bigger than, usually bigger than the African Rhythms Band, although she arranged some of those dates as well. But whenever he had a larger project, he would take those tunes to Melba for arrangements. And the more and more he talked about it, the more and more it began to reflect the same way that he and I were working on this book. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, it was clear from the beginning of our work that African Rhythms was going to be what's known in, in the publishing in industry as a, as a, uh, as told to autobiography because I was interviewing him and he was telling me his story. So it was, it was an as told to autobiography in that parlance. But one day I went to him and I said, you know, thinking about what you've been saying about Melba Liston and how you and Melba worked, why don't we call this book, why don't we do something different? Why don't we say this book is composed by Randy Weston and arranged by Willard Jenkins? And he loved the idea, so we went with it. Mm. You, you mentioned that your first connection with Randy was the CTI album, Blue Moses. Uh, given Randy's previous recordings, would you say that was an unusual CTI album? That was an unusual album. And you know, Dermot, I had some of his earlier music before that. Some of his trio dates and some of his records with Cecil Payne and others. Ray Copeland and others, and, and the Monterey date with Booker Irvin and whatnot, all those, all those records. I had some of those records. But at the time when I was a college student and I got the Blue Moses record, I love that record. Uh, I was, as a college kid, I was deeply immersed in, in the CTI sessions anyway. It, it, it was at a time where I was really trying to expand my knowledge of the music. And one of the ways of expanding one's knowledge of the music is to read the notes on the various recordings that you get and to look at the personnel. You know, when you, you look at the personnel and you listen to the record and you say, wow, my God, this is the piano player's record, but listen to that trumpet player or listen to that guitar player or listen to that tenor player. And then next time you go to the record store, you look for something by that person. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And so you, you start evolving your interest in the music and your record collection that way. And so CTI, as you know, Creed Taylor had like kind of a stable of musicians, various recordings. And Blue Moses was one of those uh, because in order to make the Blue Moses record, Creed Taylor insisted that Randy use some of his guys. And in that case, that meant Freddie Hubbard, uh, Grover Washington Jr., Ron Carter, Hubert Laws, Ayrto, Billy Cobham, you know, some of the usual guys that showed up on those CTI records. And so 
that contributed to my interest in that record and to my interest in Randy Weston because he handled that recording so beautifully and he, he was able to avoid some of the cliches that you might find on some of those CPI oh. records where they're, you know, jazz, mm. jazz versions of pop standards and that kind of thing. Randy insisted on his own music and it came through. So there was something really special about that Blue Moses record. And it, it really made me a Randy Weston fan. It also fascinated me to learn that Creed Taylor opted for Don Sibeski's arrangement of Blue Moses over Melba's. What happened there? You know, Randy told the story. You know, Randy always, he kind of <laughs> chuckled about Blue Moses. And he would refer to Blue Moses as, that was my hit record. You know, <laughs> because of the CTI, because of the CTI push, I suppose that Blue Moses sold a little better than some of his other recordings had. Uh, it was, I guess, it was a little higher profile record because it was Randy working with those CTI All Star types. But at any rate, for the Blue Moses date, as usual, as I said, when Randy works with, with unusual, un, unusual uh, groups of musicians or larger groups of musicians, he always turned to Melba to write the arrangements. So the same was true with the Blue Moses record. Melba wrote all these arrangements. They went into the studio, they recorded them. Uh, Freddie Hubbard and Grover and all of them were thrilled with to work with Randy. I mean, Randy used to say that thereafter, whenever he'd see Grover Washington, Grover would always say, man, when are we gonna make another record? You know? Mm -hmm. And so, so everybody was happy with the record. So Randy and Azadine, his son, who's also played on the record, mm -hmm. they go back to Tangier, Morocco, and to their club. So one night they're in the club, and the mail arrives, and it's the master of Blue Moses from CTI for him to check out. Mm -hmm. So he puts the master on, and boom, there's all this orchestration, and he's like, well, where'd that come from? Well, you know, it turns out that Creed Taylor had determined that he didn't necessarily want Melba's arrangements, so he took the music and sifted it through Don Sebesky's oh. uh, arranging prowess. <laughs> and, 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 and it came out a fine record, but I guess we'll never know what it sounded like with Melba's arrangements. And that's unfortunate. Are there any special moments in the autobiography that were left out that you can talk about? Special moments that were left out? You know, <coughs> Randy was never, and you know him well enough to know this as well, Randy was never the kind of kiss and tell or the kind of guy who was going to tell stories out of school. And, you know, he, would, he, was, he was laying out all the cards on his life. But there were certain things, certain, you know, relationships with, 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 with women that he had that, that he, was, he was loath to include in the book. In other words, he didn't want to include any dirt. OK, and there were some cases where I was like, wow, that's a great story. We need to keep that in there. But no, he didn't want that in there. And so I had to respect that. And so I, I can't put my finger on one thing, as you asked. I can't put my finger on one thing that was left out of the book that I wish had not. But it was an accumulation of those kinds of things that I think would have added a little more spice. But then, you know, it's his story. And he told it the way he wanted it told. And it's not about my proclivities or yours or whatever. It was about telling his story. Hmm. How do you assess Randy's contribution to the music? What is his legacy? Vastly underrated for one thing. I don't have to tell you that, you know that. Uh, vastly, he's vastly, un vastly underrated and overlooked. But when people connect with his music, they realize the enormity of his contribution. And his legacy, his most lasting legacy to me is that in the history of jazz music, there has been no composer from a jazz perspective who is more closely or more deeply connected with his African ancestry than Randy Weston. There is no, no jazz composer or musician who uh, has more deeply explored his African heritage uh, 
and his relationship to various ancient cultures than Randy Weston. And I suppose his Africanness and his insistence on that and his upholding African traditions and his insistence as one of his records is titled that, uh, you know, we are seeking, we are in search of the ancestors. You know, that is the, I think one of the lasting legacies of Randy Weston that he touched upon and immersed himself in his Africanness as much, if not more so, than any other jazz composer that I know of. You also took a trip to Africa with him. How, what kind of effect that had on you? When I, when I uh, started working with him, uh, it was very clear early on that I was going to have to go to Africa and that my preference would be that I go to Africa with Randy. So I could see certain things through his eyes. And more specifically, that I was going to have to go to Morocco. Because I, like others, didn't really have a grasp on the Black perspective of Morocco. Like others, I tended to think of Africa and North Africa in terms of Arabs. <laughs> right. The mm -hmm. and Arab evolution. As opposed, as opposed to the Black African evolution. And so it was clear I was going to have to go to, to Morocco with him. So I remember it very clearly. It's, it's uh, Memorial Day, uh, 2001. And it's like a month, three weeks to a month after my father had, had passed. It, it, it wasn't even that long, but it was, it was shortly after my father passed. So I had been in Cleveland uh, dealing with, uh, with, 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 with his, his, his passing and his service and, and, and my mother's situation and that whole thing, all the family relationship. So I had not long, not there long, long thereafter come back home. And so Memorial Day 2001, I'm sitting at my house. It's an off, it's a Monday, it's an off day from work. So I'm just sitting there kind of reflecting. And the phone rings, and it's Randy Weston. I pick up the phone, and he immediately, after he says hello, he immediately says, are you ready to go to Africa? So I'm thinking to myself, this guy's playing a joke on me. OK, <laughs> I, 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 I'll play along with it. Yeah, I'm ready to go. He said, OK, well, we leave next Thursday. So what had happened is that a Moroccan television crew had determined that they wanted to make a documentary of Randy's relationship with the Moroccan people in general and his relationship with the Ganawa in particular. And so they wanted him to come over and do a series of interviews and stay for a couple of weeks so they could shoot uh, this video, this documentary footage. And so he convinced them, they didn't know me from Adam, but he convinced them that they should bring me along with him so that at certain points I could interview him in English, you know, because they didn't necessarily, they, they weren't necessarily, they, they were they were Arabic and French speakers primarily, although all, most of them spoke English. But he convinced them that they needed me to come over and interview him. And so what 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 happened was we we saw that uh, uh, this was also an excellent opportunity for us to continue with our more extensive interviews for the book. Mm. Because, you know, you, you know Randy Wilson, you, you've, been, you, you've been in this house before, so you know how it is when he's in Brooklyn. You know, <laughs> phone ringing all the time, the doorbell's ringing, people want to check with Randy. So there are always constant interruptions. But here, if we, went, if we were in a place like Morocco, it'd be just the two of us. We could sit there for hours and hours and interview for the book. So that became kind of our sidebar. So they brought me to Morocco. So we traveled to Morocco and it, it, it was life, it was a life altering experience for me uh, because, because of the immersion and because of the people he introduced me to and, and, and the cultural aspects he introduced me to. And we, we saw one of the Ganawa's uh, spiritual ceremonies known as a Leela, uh, 
We experienced that an all night ceremony, all these different elements that I was, was experiencing for the very first time. And so that particular trip was amazing. Willard, uh, thank you so much, man, for your impressions, your recollections. Uh, we all really marvel about Randy. I, I knew him very well, knew his dad, Frank, uh, who was an um, amazing personality, an amazing cook, and full of fire. I remember that much about him. But thank you, bro, right. for sharing Randy with us. And take care, man. Well, thank you, Dermot. Thank you so much for being interested in Randy enough to do what you're doing. And please let me know when it goes up.